I'm trying to record a podcast. Hey, everybody. Angela Ardolino with Your Natural Dog. And my guest today is Dr. Ashley Mack, who is a physical therapist and an expert on sciatica pain. He actually has a podcast called Fix My Sciatica, which is one of the number one podcasts out there because so many humans suffer from this uh, pain in our back or lower back. But did you know that dogs suffer from it also? Our cats, any of our pets do. So um, I think it's kind of crazy because you never hear about it in the animal industry. So we're going to break it down. He is literally the expert. He helps adults all the time with back pain and figuring out and getting rid of that back pain without any medications. And so he can help you without medications or surgery. He can bring you some relief. He uh, has a doctorate in physical therapy and he is filled with information. You're going to really enjoy this. Stay tuned. This is Odie, my baby old man, a.k.a. Barky Von Schnauzer. He's 11 years old and the love of my life. So Odie's favorite thing is to run up the stairs at night when we go to bed. And I noticed a couple years ago that he would stop midway up. And that's when I knew he was suffering from arthritis and joint pain. So the only treatments that I was being offered were harmful prescription drugs that cause liver damage and suppress the immune system. And I just wasn't willing to do that for my senior dog. And full spectrum CBD oil was the only thing that worked. I would give it to him and literally within 15 minutes, he was puppy-like again. I could see that he wasn't in pain, he wasn't panting, he was running up the stairs. So on Odie, I use Ease, which is a 550 milligram full spectrum CBD oil with frankincense essential oil, turmeric and hemp oil, and it's great for arthritis, aches and pains, and allergies. No one likes to see their dog suffer. I know I didn't. And to be able to find an all-natural product that doesn't cause additional harm and helps them is a lifesaver for me, and it brings me so much peace of mind. CBD Dog Health, healing naturally. And we're back with your natural dog and my guest, Dr. Ashley Mack. And I'm so excited to talk to you because, A, my favorite thing about you is that you believe in solving the issues without medications or surgery and believing in, um, basically, you're a physical therapist. But what I love is that you um, came to me and said, I want to talk about sciatica pain in dogs. And I went, wow, I've never heard that before. And one of my favorite things is when I find doctors like yourself um, and, you know, integrative uh, veterinarians and doctors of holistics and functional and all those good people who have extended their knowledge and expertise to learn more and, um, and have, and how we equate that to what our pets are suffering from is also what we suffer from. So what are the percentages of people that are suffering from sciatica and lower back pain? Like how many people? Because I feel like everybody is. It's a, it's a huge percent. So I think the most recent article I came upon was about 40% of humans are actually going to go through some form of sciatica or low back pain in their life. And that, and that is, and that's huge, right? 40%. That's what, you know, you know, four out of every 10 people, that's a large percent. And it's a huge industry. People are making businesses and making their incomes just on addressing this specific issue. So I could imagine that our pets, our dogs especially, are probably suffering even more from this and we don't even know it. And we don't and we don't call it sciatica pain or anything in in the veterinary industry or for dogs. Why do we call it something completely different? I think a large part of it is the fact that um, and I'm only I'm going to go back to my days back in, in college where I had this one class called comparative anatomy and comparative anatomy pretty much is in essence looking at the human body, but then also how does that carry on over from different animals? And the reality is the fact that uh, the reason why it's called something different is because even though we're, we're both mammals, humans, and dogs, um, there's still a lot of different, there are a lot of differences that actually exist between humans and dogs. And so you're going to have different muscles, you're going to have a different distribution of muscles and the way that nerves work. 
And as a result, we can't really call it the same thing because of the fact that there are some pretty major differences between the two. But we both have sciatic nerves. Yes, we both have sciatic nerves. And that really, I mean, if you look at it, it's uh, the, the way, it, especially in humans, the sciatic nerve is actually an extension of nerves that actually come out of our spine. And so it's a series of various different nerves. Um, specifically, we're looking at the, the lumbar vertebrae L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3. So those are the levels in which it exits the spine. And then once they exit the spine, it actually forms the sciatic nerve, which is probably one of the longest nerves in our human body. And also, if you look at in dogs as well, um, dogs have very long torsos. They're, I mean, they're walking on all fours. And so it extends all the way from their spine and it travels down their leg. And so it is, uh, it's, yeah, it's the longest nerve in the body. And that actually will influence the, the entire lower half of, of our body, which includes like our leg function. So what's blowing my mind is that, so I don't know if you know this part of me, but I have a rescue farm where I bring in sick old dogs and, you know, do the same thing, heal them naturally without any surgery and hopefully medications. Um, and if I do use, use medications, they're all natural. Um, but I've never heard this. I remember hearing of lumbar, lumbar, lumbar sacral disease was one of the things that my schnauzer she was going, the vet was going between um, degenerative myelopathy and lumbar sacral disease, which is sciatica damage or injury or whatever in dogs. Is that the equivalent? That's a great question. And so uh, let's let's break down these words a little bit, especially in regards to like how it presents itself. And I'm also for you, uh, for for the listeners out there, I'm also going to sh- uh, use kind of like a couple analogies in regards to what you would see in the human body as well. Because the more that we can understand how this translates on over to us, the better we can get a better uh, the better understanding we can get. And so let's Wait, let me about- and let me pause you for a second because I didn't sure. finish that thought. So I also oh, own sorry. a very busy groom shop which I can't wait because we're, we literally do yoga in our shop because these girls have to bend down and pick up dogs all day long. So we're going to talk about how to do that correctly, but I've never heard of it. So all I hear is and see are these old dogs who have gone lame and have lameness or hip dysplasia or arthritis. I have never, ever heard the sciatic nerve being brought up. So I feel like this is going to be so informative and make really a lot of people go, oh, so sorry to interrupt you, but I wanted to say that it's not something that like, why didn't my vet say it's like sciatica? It's like when you have sciatica pain in you, this is what your dog is suffering. from. That's never been said or mentioned. And I've been doing this for a while. So thank you. I'll let you talk now. <laughs> of course. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a lot of similarities. Like, um, I mean, some things will be called differently. But I, I think the biggest part through all of this is trying to I mean, if you look at and it. In the, in the U.S. healthcare system, or even just the healthcare system itself, you'll have various different professionals. So you're going to have your physicians, you're going to have your physical therapists, your chiropractors, like each person is going to be looking at things very differently. And I also see, um, I can imagine what it's like out in the veterinary medicine as well, where you have the physicians or the veterinarians who are doing the medicine, you have the, the techs who are implementing, you have everyone who kind of sees things in a different angle. And I think one of the challenges is that when your dog is sick or when you're when when your dog is not feeling well, the first person that you end up going to is the veterinarian. And the just like a general doctor, they're seeing everything. They're right. seeing they can't whole, know everything. Seeing, they can't right. know everything. And um everyone like when you're in the business of helping and healing, that's all you want to do. But there are definitely limitations to our knowledge. I know for myself, I can't really I, I don't know that much about the medications or I can't know that much about medications. It's not part of what I do. And so that I think that's one of the big reasons as to why you don't really hear it as much be, because of there's so much to know about the human body. And we have specialists like myself be able to say, how does this translate on over to the human body or even what is this person going through or what are our dogs going through? That's where things start to get a little bit more confusing or we might not even necessarily be informed about it as well. So there's just so much information that is out there and it can be very, very overwhelming to try to cycle through, figure out what is going on. And so let's talk about those two conditions that you were, that you, you came about. Um, 
Remind me again. What? Uh, so we have the degenerative was... myelopathy and lumbar lumbar sacral disease, or it's yeah. also called lumbar sacral something else. But those again, that's when my dog uh, went lame in the back, and like he was doing this weird nerve response, kicking. He was like mm-hmm. kicking a leg out. Yeah, he yeah. Was nine. He had just become a senior citizen, and sure enough, that's what she was going between. Um, of course, yeah. we resolved it with chiropractic, physical therapy, acupuncture, and full spectrum hip extract. Um, yeah. And it represented itself uh, le- this last year, which now he's 16. Uh, wow. And we did the same thing again. I didn't even panic this time. I was like, oh, let's go back. Let's do repeat it, repeated it, and got rid of it within you know the same day. It only lasted like a day. So. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty cool, but I never hear about this, so I can't wait to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, it's really interesting. So let's, let's talk about degenerative myelopathy. And so um, if we were to break those down, I, I'll, I'll look at, um, there's three different segments. You have the degenerative aspect, which degeneration is a normal part of the aging process. Consider kind of like wrinkles. Wrinkles right. themselves, they're not pathological. It's a normal process of aging in regards to both humans and dogs. But if we look at this concept of myelopathy, And so Milo, we're looking at, I mean, one muscle function, but also the level of irritation and involvement really more so about around, uh, the nerves, particularly around like the spinal cord, that's where you're having like the most amount of irritation. And then we have pathy, which identifies that there is something that is not going wrong. So it's really a description of saying the nerves are not functioning because there's some sort of degeneration or aging that is happening. And in some cases, depending on your dog. Um, also, depending on their activity levels and their lifestyle, it will actually either accelerate or slow down the degeneration as well. And one of the really interesting things about degeneration is the fact that, again, degeneration itself is not a bad thing. But if you have it come on too quickly or too fast or happen at the same time where there's a ton of stresses, it can then actually present itself in some sort of limitation, whether it be the nerve kicks that your dog was going through. And then it's up as a dog owner, it's really alarming, right? You see your dog and their, their main method of locomotion is walking, right? walking and running. They're on all fours. And so if one tire is out, if one leg is out, you're going to really notice it. And then let's talk about this lumbosacral disease, which is often like for, for you listeners out there, lumbosacral disease is very similar to if, um, in the human body, we call it the degenerative disc or spinal arthritis. Again, it's this concept of degeneration, the general wrinkles that develop over time. Lumbosacral disease identifies that it's affecting the, 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 the lumbar, which is going to be the lower aspects of your spine into your sacrum. And the sacrum is this triangular shaped bone that actually is fused with your pelvis. So if you were to put your hand, I, I, for lack of a better word, it's like the area right above the, the crease of your buttocks, if I have to say that's what that is. And so lumbosacral disease is really an, an identification that there is irritation of those of that specific area um, of those bones. And when you have the uh, wearing down and what's interesting actually about bones is the fact that they don't wear down like as if, I mean, you're living out in Florida with boats, right? So if boats, the reason why you have to wash your boat very frequently is because the salt water is actually going to corrode um, the metal. So like the metal will truly wear down. The interesting thing with the bones that we have, not just our bones, but also the bones of dogs, when you rub two bones together, it doesn't wear away. Interestingly enough, bones get stronger and they grow with rubbing and pressure. So what that means is that when you have these bones that are rubbing, those, the bones will kind of get a little bit bigger. It is actually going to change how those bones move. And so unlike a door hinge, where if you move it a ton of times, it's going to start to break down. It's going to get stiff. It's going to make a little bit more noise. It might creak a little bit more, but also opening that door is going to be very, very different compared to if you were to open a fresh door that had freshly oiled hinges. And so because these joints are not moving correctly, you're going to have irritation of the nerves because the nerves is what exits out of these bones. And that itself can present itself. So the interesting thing about, so how does this tie all into sciatica itself, right? Sciatica is really more so a description 
of the symptoms or the things that are happening. So uh, sciatica is irritation in the sciatic nerve, but the sciatic nerve, as I said, is actually the longest nerve in the body, both dogs and humans. And so because it's the longest nerve, there are many areas of which this nerve can get irritated, get irritated in our backs. It can get irritated in the pelvis. It can actually even get irritated amongst the thigh, the knee, and also our foot as well. There's so many different areas. And that's why this condition is in a way hard to treat and manage. But also, it's the most exciting because there's so many problem points that you can actually address, which means that before you lose hope, there are so many other things that you can look at before actually having to say, I need to go under the needle or my dog needs to go under the needle. I have to go through some sort of surgery. And that's one of the cool, magical things about it. Uh, what a wonderful explanation. Uh, you're really good at that. I like it. It's like you should have a podcast or something. <laughs> you, he does. But um, but I love that description. And so basically what should have happened is I should have brought my dog to the veterinarian, got some sort of diagnosis, even if it was kind of between the two. And then I should have been recommended to a physical therapist. Yes. Yeah. I think, and this is- And are there x-rays involved or anything else involved before we go to the physical therapist or does a physical therapist do that for us? That's a great question. So I can only say from uh, from human studies, but interesting enough, x-rays and MRIs are actually really great at spotting tumors, cancers, and fractures. And um, I think it would be safe to assume that's kind of what the same thing is for dogs as well, like x-rays and MRIs. Um, that in itself, those things will actually be useful in ruling out any sort of what we call those, uh, we call red flag pathology. So things that would actually be outside the scope of what a physical therapist or chiropractor could be providing. When I started practicing about 10 years ago, uh, dog and canine physical therapy was a very, very new profession. And thankfully, over the past 10 years, there have been more and more professionals who can actually provide physical therapy services to dogs. And because it's still such a growing concentration, a lot of veterinarians are still not very aware that there are physical therapists that can actually help wow. dogs. And because they weren't and, taught it, so they don't know that it even exists. Wow. Exactly. It's hard to, I mean, if you look at it from a clinical standpoint, luckily for me, I have a lot of free time so I can expand my knowledge. But if you're looking at full time clinicians, they're working 40 hours a week there and they're and and and, and veterinarians they are dealing with dogs and animals. And I actually work with veterinarians from a, from a rehab standpoint as well. And a, it's, it's hard to one add more knowledge on top of all the knowledge that you've accumulated over the years of schooling and also practice. And so when you have something that is still relatively new, I mean, 10 years, 10 years is a pretty short bath time, but I really foresee that over the next five to 10 years, the expansion of dog canine physical therapy is going to be greater. And then one, we're going to be able to save, uh, it, well, the way I see it is it can be a lot less medications and also extending the quality of those years that 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 our dogs go through, especially as they go a little bit deeper into their age. Absolutely. Um, one of my favorite physical therapists is a doc, a veterinary physical therapist is Dr. James St. Clair. And same thing, everything through physical therapy, education, and then natural supplements that help that degeneration and help with the pain and things that are going to happen, you know, whether you like it or not. Um, what are some signs that your dog may be experiencing um, sciatica pain? And is it, how could you tell the difference, you know, between sciatica and let's say hip dysplasia or something else? Because the slip disc is what's causing the sciatica pain. So those are kind of the same thing. If you got a slip disc, most likely you're going to have a sciatica pain, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the big things. Like, so, so if we were to look at, excuse me, I will, uh, premise with, let's oh, look. Wait, at the, can I ask you to move, um, over your, cut? you know, this we is, we do this on YouTube also. So I love it too. <laughs> um, okay. I just get so excited. Okay. So I start drifting. Let my left side is my strong side. That's why I keep leaning. Um, okay. So let's premise with the fact that, um, so in the human body, like I think one of, so I think one of the big challenges when it comes to trying to figure out like, what's the difference between, hip dysplasia versus uh, a slip disc or sciatica pain in your dog 
is the fact that they can't really communicate with you, right? They're really communicating through their body language and also how they're moving. For you as a human, uh, for you experiencing this pain as a human, if you're having a hip issue, if you're having a, a true hip di- issue, say like hip dysplasia or hip arthritis, a lot of the pain that you're going to be experiencing is going to be deep more so in your groin. A lot of people think my outer butt pain or the side of my hip is really related to hip arthritis. Really a large part of it is actually going to be related to deep in the groin. When you're looking at something like a slip disc or even sciatica pain, that's where the pain is going to be radiating more so out towards the buttock, really more on the backside or the outer edge of your hip. So that's what it's like for humans. If you were to look at it in dogs, one of the big things that you can be looking at is one, how is this dog, how is your dog moving? Are they limping? And from there, there's a couple of different signs because if we're looking at true tissue injury, like if they have a hurt knee or hurt hip or the muscles themselves are actually in pain. If you were to take your thumb and press on those muscles, that could be influencing the the walking pattern, that the abnormal walking pattern you see. If you press on it and if your dog doesn't wince, that means that most likely that the inflammation is not really happening kind of like underneath your thumb, not necessarily at the muscle. And so one of the big things is, I mean, one, if you notice your dog walking, not the greatest, very differently from before, I definitely recommend go get it looked at because every dog is built differently and they might be limping for a couple of different reasons, but they might be able to really pinpoint what those issues are. It could And be this limping cut. is half we're looking for is in the back end, right? Not in y- the front. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Back end, back end limping. And that in itself. I, wanna, we have I to just want to yeah. say front leg limping was the first indication that my Doberman had osteosarcoma. So the Uh, moment she started favoring her left wrist, I immediately took her in to to see. And and that's exactly what it was. So if you've got a large breed dog and they're favoring a front limb, be sure to check that out first so they can get ahead of it. And uh, do you mind if I ask when your Doberman was was favoring that that wrist, um, as the owner, like, did you, like, if you were to have, say, like, pressed on that wrist, did the, did your Doberman kind of wince a little bit or no? Not a, okay. No, I'm not yeah. first. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, she would, so I didn't amputate the leg until 26 months. So she would uh, run full blast chasing bunnies, everything with just holding the, the tumor leg up. We didn't yeah. uh, amputate it until it started. You know, it it grew another tumor, which started oozing, and I could tell it was bothering her, so we finally did. But, yeah, yeah, we kept it completely in her wrist. And and talk about what bones do, man. It was crazy watching the bone destroy itself and rebuild and destroy and rebuild and just keep growing into this harsh bone. Yeah. Yeah. So the actual bone part didn't hurt her. It's the bone deterioration inside, which if she put down weight or hit it on something, she definitely cried. Yeah. And so if you have that local sensitivity, as in like you can pinpoint where that sensitivity is, as compared to more of a sciatica, it's kind of more like a diffusion of might not necessarily be pinpoint. That's where you're looking at, okay, this could be possible signs of some sort of nerve irritation. And then it says, okay, well, um, what, what other signs. And so, um, what I assume, like if we're looking at it, I, I think the biggest thing is if you can differentiate between point tenderness, right. And being able to press on that specific area where you think could be a problem in that, and, and your dog's reaction, uh, versus no reaction that says, okay, there could be something that might not necessarily be at the specific point might be what we like to call looking further up the chain, uh, which then moves on to the hips and also to the back as well. Got it. And then, so I know we have to take a commercial break. And when we come back, I want to know, okay, so if this is what we suspect, what do we do? What can we do next? Um, But I also want to talk about some of the causes, because I couldn't believe when I started looking into the causes of what some of them can be, which is literally someone could do an injection and cause an injury to the nerve. Um, So when we come back, we're going to talk about that when we come back. 
I have a five-year-old border collie named Wednesday who suffers from car ride anxiety and travel anxiety. I have a nine-year-old Great Day named Moxie who's starting to get arthritic and it's hard to get up and move around since she's getting older. Then I have a 15-year-old dog named Harley who suffers from severe arthritis and dementias. Wednesday would just sit there and shake the entire car ride, which I didn't want to put her through that, so I stopped bringing her places. Moxie was having a hard time getting up and down the steps and in and out of bed. And Harley, he was having a really difficult time even just getting up from the laying position, and he would whine and cry and bark at night, wouldn't get a full night's sleep. Um, I've tried the other supplements, um, I've tried prescriptions, and I just didn't really like the side effects. I felt like the bad outweighed the good. So that's when I decided to give hemp oil a try. Since using this product, I can take Wednesday anywhere. I give her hemp oil about 20 minutes before the car ride and she is good to go. Moxie can run and keep up with her five-year-old sister and it's just great to see them playing again. And even Harley can jump off in the couch now, which is great. And even when he is laying on the floor, he goes to get up and he just pops right up. And it just, it warms my heart. And I'm just using one thing for all my dogs that range from 50 pounds to 145 pounds and it's all natural and I know I'm not doing more harm than good. And we're back with Dr. Ashley Mack. And what are some of the, besides age degeneration of, you know, your disc, what are some of the other causes um, for dogs to get this type of injury or pain? Yeah, so let's look at... Uh, from a couple of different causes standpoint, we'll talk about like one of the most common ones, which I often see is is often due to trauma, um, whether they collide with another dog or get to a little sc scuffle or they trip um, or anything like that, where there's actual uh, like, tr yeah, if there's any lack of a better word, trauma to that specific area, like whether it be to the back or even getting sideswiped. Uh, you brought up uh, earlier before the break, one of the really interesting things where even a possible injection um, a standard run-of-the-mill injection or tech or anything like that can actually cause the nerve to get a little bit flared up. I think it's uh, it's important to be able to make sure because uh, I'll say in, in the humans, um, one of the things that uh, we can do as physical therapists, and I believe in New Jersey and a couple other states, I think also in Colorado, can't do it in California, is this concept of what we call dry needling. And dry needling is a technique that we actually use to actually manage muscles. Love it's really dry interesting. Needling. It's it's great. It's a great. Can they do it in Florida as well? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And what's really cool is that these needles can for sure enter. It's not puncturing. These needles are very very fine. They actually move the tissues out of the way versus actually tearing the tissues. But one of the big things is that in order for your muscles to function, they actually need to have nerves that supply the electrical stimuluses. But that means that when you are injecting a muscle, you do run the risk of actually irritating or kind of encountering these nerves and that in itself that the, it's just like the sheer physical trauma from the needle on the nerve itself um which actually another thing that which it totally slipped my mind another way that you can assess um to see if the if your dog is experiencing something like sciatica it's actually through reflex testing reflex testing there's going to be various different reflexes um we're looking at the, uh, the extensor tendons, which is going to be really more so kind of like the pause, being able to see, um, and, and you're, and, and the veterinarian and also the PT in, in person can also do that as well. It's going to be the, the reflexes. It's very, very similar to like when you go to the doctor's office, they take one of those hammers and they hit you on the knee. A normal reflex would be that there's a muscle twitch. Your leg will go up. Um, an absent reflex would actually be you hit it, nothing happens. And then hyperactive reflex would actually be if you hit it and, you you kick the you kick the table across the room. That's a, that's right. a, that's the thing too. So being able to see is it a nerve related issue? That is another area because some of the challenges like you might because your dog might not be able to say I'm having issues here. It's really going to be more a physical manifestation of how it's going to be feeling. Which um, is why it's so important to find a physical therapist because they're going to be able to recognize it more than anybody. Exactly. That's going to be the big thing because the reality is that and I and I see this a lot. When you're working with a physical therapist, they're looking at your dog. They're probably spending about 30 to 45 minutes, maybe upwards to an hour, working with your pup. And so that's where we're going to be able to get all the information. And I know that when I'm dealing with humans, my sessions are about 45, uh, an hour long 
45 minutes to an hour long. So what that means is like, especially during the first session itself, it's going to be a lot of information gathering, being able to say, well, what kind of information is going on and what's going to be important for, for you listeners. Like when you take your dog to the physical therapist or even to the veterinarian as well, uh, no information is, uh, too medial in regards to all the information that you're providing, everything that you notice about your dog. And if they are off and they're doing something very different compared to what it is before, you definitely got to bring it up. Um, veterinarians, physical therapists, we're scientists. And in order for us to actually be able to provide the care and the action steps needed to take care of your dog or yourself, we need to have as much information as possible to be able to say, this is going to be the best option for you. Um, that was kind of a small side right there. Uh, I love it. And so the basic message of this um, podcast today is that I don't want pet parents to immediately think that it's these things that we hear about, like hip dysplasia or anything like that, that it could be a nerve issue and that the only way for you to address that, meaning if your dog has been diagnosed with something and you've been given some sort of medication, first of all, seek to see if there's a supplement and or some sort of physical therapy that you can do instead. And also make sure that it's the right thing because if they are getting some sort of pain meds but you're not seeing improvement in their mobility and their behavior then most likely you haven't solved the problem or helped them with their problem it might be a nerve issue so that's what the biggest thing is so for humans what you do is you do physical therapy which is what exercises um, and I guess you do them in person and then what, send them home kind of the same way we would do with a pet? Yeah, you, you would do them in person or you could also do it virtually as well. I think that's one of the great things when dealing with humans, communication is a little bit easier. Um, I wouldn't be surprised that there are virtual physical therapists who actually work with dogs, but it's probably a lot harder, especially communicating via Zoom. I just remember during the pandemic, just trying to communicate with my with, with Sherman and Gus, they they didn't really care. They knew that I was talking with them. They recognized my voice, but they couldn't recognize the smell because I was coming from the phone, right? And Got so, um, but yeah, like working, is, you're looking at a concept of exercises and stretches. The way when it comes to providing physical therapy for the dog, very, very similar, but being able to create it in an environment where the dog can really be, your dog can be successful. And that could be something along the lines of, massage doing hands-on treatment massage the muscles massage in the back also realigning the body if we're looking at this nerve irritation related to the spine itself it's like okay we're going to work on providing possibly some sort of bracing some sort of way to minimize the stress on the nerves themselves and then uh, an, another option is water therapy i know that uh sherman had a had a couple of knee issues. And so getting him in the water, love the water because water itself- Low is, impact. Is low impact. Also from a swelling standpoint as well, the hydrostatic pressure, which it, pretty much what's me, what that means is when you put your limb in water, the pressure is actually exerted by the water itself. It actually helps a lot with swelling. And it's also very soothing as well. And because it's low impact, the dogs can move and, and it makes it more enjoyable. And uh, from- from a consumer standpoint, when you're the owner and you're there at physical therapy, feel free to ask questions and try to understand like what's going on to figure out how can you replicate this at home? Because, and I say this for both my human patients and people who, are, who have dogs as well, is that the one hour of treatment that you have in the clinic only accounts for about 4% of the day, which means that if you're seeing them once or twice a week, that's an even smaller percentage throughout the day. So if your dog is feeling great within PT, fantastic. But we have to figure out what are the opportunities, what are the action steps that we could take that we can apply through the rest of the day so we can facilitate and reinforce these positive changes. Awesome. And this is, you know, uh, the physical therapist that I mentioned, um, Dr. James Sinclair. We ha I love having conversations with him and trading, you know, information because, what I love is that this is a non-surgical, non-medical way. Well, I shouldn't say medical. It is a natural way of fixing these issues. And if your dog is dealing, which they're going to be dealing with inflammation because the body's off, right? Things are rubbing together. There's irritation. So inflammation is going to happen. 
And so is pain. And that's why I love a full spectrum hemp extract so much because it can help um, if your dog is suffering in these things. Any of the ailments that we mentioned, a full spectrum hemp extract um, will help. So another way to completely help your dog heal itself naturally through physical therapy and natural supplements, plants, mushrooms, adaptogens, love them. I don't have a pain med on my farm. I haven't given a pain med in forever. So it's totally possible. Amazing. Um, Dr. Mack, thank you so much for joining us. How do people get in touch with you or find out more about you? Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so I have the website, ifixyoursciatica.com. Um, if you aren't familiar with how to spell sciatica, it's spelled S-C-I-A-T-I-C-A. -I -I and I also have the Fix Your Sciatica podcast, which is actually the number one sciatica podcast on both Apple and Spotify. You can also message me directly at info at ifixyoursciatica.com with any of your questions and I would be happy to answer them for you. Thank you so much for your time today. I learned so much. Thank you.